Oh, sorry. Okay. Good morning uh, to this new morning session. Uh, we are very happy to start with uh, Jurek uh, Kowalski Glickman uh, with a few remarks on uh, on Kappa. Okay. Thank you, uh, Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me. This is the first time I have a honor to join this community uh, and tell you something about my stuff. And uh, I also apologize that I didn't send the abstract of the talk, but there was not much to, I didn't have much to say in the abstract, I just few remarks. All right, so specifically, I would, uh, there will be two parts of the talk. Uh, right, yeah, good. Uh, uh, first, I would like to spend some time telling you uh, what Kappa Poincare symmetry is in the language of uh, well of field theory instead of the language of abstract Kappa algebra. And then I will, the second part would be about uh, well, phenomenology, at least as uh, well, some pieces, bits and pieces of phenomenology that we seem to understand. Now it's based on two papers, uh, one with Michele Arzano, with the, which is this, this is this point, the first point, the first part, and second with uh, Bevilacqua, who, Andrea Bevilacqua, who is my student, and Wojtek Wyszlicki, who is a particle theorist. Uh, and this paper in turn is actually based on, on other, on a couple of other papers that we, uh, that we published uh, <clears throat> within the last couple of years. Okay, so let me start with point one. Uh, historically, the Kappa Poincare <coughs> symmetry was discovered uh, by the group of Professor Lukierski, who is not with us, but I hope he will join us soon uh, in, uh, <coughs> in the late 80s and 
or early 90s of previous century. And then it was uh, in mid 90s, it was improved by Majita and Ruwek and you actually acquired the, uh, the present form. Uh, and so let me, after this little historical remark, let me, let me go to the formalist. Well, I, I should mention that this picture, uh, so I owe, uh, I got from Julia and all the time I actually presented the picture. I thank her for, for the beautiful artwork. So uh, my starting point will be current momentum space. And let me also spend a well, couple, of, a couple of minutes uh, on, on the history. The idea of momentum space was actually first conceived or first considered by Born in uh, late 30s. And the idea was that since in GR, the space time is dynamical and curved, why don't you consider the, consider the curved momentum space? And this idea was, was actually, <clears throat> uh, during the years, it was actually considered by many people. Uh, again, in late, in late uh, 90s, early 21st century, Shan Majid made his point that the current momentum space is a one-to-one -one relation with non-commutative space-time. So if you think about non-commutative non theories, you can think you can think of them uh, from the perspective of current momentum space. So, so this is kind of a this two intuitions of Born that uh, there is no reason not to think about dynamical momentum space, and of Shan Majid that uh, the curved momentum space is related to non-commutative geometry uh, was kind of a first motivation. But then there are more motivations to consider seriously the, the theories theories with curved momentum space. Uh, in the uh, in the context of quantum gravity, which is of course the the, the main the main goal that we want um, the, the main thing that we want to understand using these exercises. Well, first of all, it naturally arises in two plus one gravity. So there is a whole industry within two plus one gravity coupled to particles and field, and, and then you actually find that uh, the curve momentum space is a natural object that arises there. Essentially, as a result of integrate, because the degrees of freedom of gravity are topological to plus one dimension, if you integrate them out, the resulting effective theory for matter is a, is a theory with curved momentum space. And then you can imagine that since there must exist something like a planar limit of three plus one gra quantum gravity, which should be described by two plus one theory, you imagine that perhaps there is a uh, this is also relevant for, for in physical dimensions, at least in some, uh, at least in some, uh, uh, in some limiting case. So, so there might exist some regime of quantum of, of uh, three plus one quantum gravity in with the flat space time limit and the which is characterized by by the mass scale. And this then this mass scale is realized in this in this setup. Uh, as a curvature of momentum space. So, uh, in what I'm gonna, in, this, in the following, I would like to really investigate a very particular momentum space manifold, which is, has a form, which is a group, which is a group manifold of the group, uh, which is called A and 3, at least in, in this community, the group is called A and 3. There are many names of this group, but this is the group which is in my community is used which is, as a manifold is essentially half, like here, half of the city space. And of course, this is a manifold of a constant curvature, one of a kappa squared. Since this is a momentum manifold, the curvature is inverse, inverse mass, as I mentioned, inverse mass. Right. So let, let me actually play with it. I would like to understand if I want to build my physical, so, so the question is, if I want to build my physical theories, my physical theory based on the, this curved momentum space manifold, what should I do? And what mathematical ingredients I need to have in order to be able to, to do that. So first of all, let us play a little bit with this, uh, with the Lie algebra of this Lie group. It consists of four generators. This is, the, this is the abelian part, so this is the A part. And this matrix is actually nilpotent matrices. So the algebra consists of one abelian matrix and three nilpotent matrices, they satisfy this kind of 
commutational relations, which are from the perspective of non commutative geometry, actually, uh, uh, these commutational relations, uh, if, if X's are interpreted as positions in some non commutative manifold, this is called, this manifold is called Kappa Minkowski space. Okay, but uh, from our perspective, these things are just the algebra objects. And then the group element can be written in this form. This is, uh, you know, there is nothing sacred about, about this, this particular uh, way you present the group manifold, but it's, it turns out to be particularly convenient for calculation. So there is nothing particular about it, but it's, first of all, it's convenient for calculation. And secondly, it's, it was traditionally used <coughs> way back before, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the papers, uh, I think by, uh, well, there the was kind of, there was the paper about the plane, non commutative plane waves uh, by Amelino and, and Majid, and they use this, this representation. So this, this is a traditional one. Well, if I know X's and I know P's, uh, okay, well, let me just stress that if you think about the G as a point on the group manifold, then PI and P0 can be considered uh, coordinates of this point, right? Just by, in, but just by logarithmic mapping with each one each point on the group manifold, I can, I can associate these numbers P i P zero. So I can think of them as coordinates in the, in the, at least yes. Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. Epsilon I are just unit vectors. Unit vectors, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one. Sorry. I, I should have given an explanation. All right, good. So, but then given this five dimensional matrix representation that I find particularly useful and I will be, use, I will be using frequency during this talk, I can actually write the group element in the form of this matrix. And then it is parameterized by some numbers. There are some complicated expression for these numbers, but first of all, you can find that this column, the last column of the matrix, Consists of four number of five numbers, and they also these five numbers are actually coordinates here. So these are the coordinates p0, p1, and p4. So this serve as kind of embedding coordinates because that these are the coordinates in which of the five in the five dimensional space in which this hyperboloid is actually embedded in, and we find by just by calculation we find that there is that this identity is satisfied, which means that the group manifold is actually nothing but a part of the city space. So, yes. Oh, they, they, this is, these are just matrices. Oh, uh, uh, all right, okay. Well, these guys commute, the guys X, I, X, G commute. That, that's how, that's why I split them. Well, so I, first I could compute this one. This is a five by five matrix. Then I compute this one. This is again a five by five matrix. This is this you can easily compute because this matrix is omnipotent. So in the expansion, there are just three terms. This is just a simple matrix you can, you can easily compute and then you multiply this to matrices. It's simple, right? I mean, you, you need to spend a couple of minutes to do this calculation, but, but it, it, it's really simple. Okay, good. So now uh, let me try to start thinking in a, in a kind of a field theoretical way. So, or quantum mechanical way. So suppose I have a momentum space, momentum eigenstate. The momentum space is this manifold. So I parameterize my, I parameterize my state with a group element, which is fine. And I define what is the action of momentum operator. So momentum operator acting on the state, it actually reads this last column, this last column of the matrix. Okay. So the claim is that I can actually identify the last column of the matrix as physical momenta in this theory. Good. Now, uh, now I really need to now I really need to understand what does it mean to have what does it mean 
a total momentum of say a two particle state. So suppose I have two states labeled by G and H, the group elements here. And then, well, the most natural, most obvious, but uh, well, you, you, may, you may try to think if it's unique or if, if there are any alternatives, but basically since I have a group structure and I have this momentum eigenvalue for a state, so I say the total momentum of the state G tends G, well, of the two particle state of made of G and H is just the momentum as computed from the matrix G times H. Okay. Pretty simple uh, and pretty obvious and pretty natural. And then what you have, well, what happens is that I take these two matrices, one and two, I multiply them. There is a lot of things here when I, which I denoted by star, which are completely you know, irrelevant for us at this moment. But what is relevant is the last column because P reads, you know, the last column of the of the resulting matrix. And then you find the following rule. So you just from doing this multiplication, you uh, find what the entries in this matrix here are and you identify it. Uh, with the total momentum of the of the two particle state. Okay, good. If I now know what is the total momentum of the two particle state, I can define another notion because knowing that I can define in which way the momentum operator acts on the two particle state. And it acts with the uh, with the operation, which is uh, in Hopf algebra language is called coproduct. And the definition is that if I apply the momentum uh, on the two particle state, just a tensor product of two, uh, of two one particle states, then the momentum that it reads is the total momentum of a system, which is exactly what we want, which is given by this O plus. Yes. I, now suppose I, well, I have a Hilbert space, which is labeled by, by, uh, by momentum eigenstates, or I can label them by group element. And then I tensor this Hilbert spaces, right? And I would like at the end of the day to interpret this tensor to, to this tensors of two Hilbert spaces to be kind of a two, two particles in Hilbert space, okay? The momenta commute. Uh, the momenta commute, of course, they do, yes. All right, so, so you see that uh, we actually, you actually got the first ingredient of Hopf algebra just from the group multiplication, which is, uh, okay, well, for, for Hopf algebra practitioners, this is not surprising and it's essentially trivial uh, because from the Hopf algebra perspective, you may think that this, uh, that this momenta are essentially functions on the, functions on the group manifold and there is a natural hop structure on the of the space of function on the group manifold. So, so, so from hop, hop, hop algebra perspective is completely trivial. This exercise is, you know, the first page of the, of many textbooks on hop algebras, but this really gives you kind of an insight into how to construct field, which is my goal, how to construct a field theory uh, uh, eventually with the curve with, with the with the curve momentum space of the sort, and then you can read off knowing what the total momentum is. You can read off what this operator delta is. Okay, so there is the first hurdle. I already know what is the coproduct for momenta, and then uh, uh, there is another structure that I really need to do. I really need to understand what does it mean to have an inverse momentum. Right, it's kind of non-trivial. In your standard case, you have a minus momenta, you don't think about it. But of course, the minus is related to the abelian composition law, right? So I would like really to learn what does it mean to have an inverse momentum. And I, my, I, I uh, and then I derive it essentially from the, compo from, from the condition that the total momentum of the element, which is labeled by G and Another element, so, so two particle state, one is labeled by G, another is labeled by the by G minus one. So the inverse element, the total momentum of this should be one, which should be zero, right? So from this, I derive, uh, I derive what is 
uh, so this is zero, this must be plus, I know what it is. This I know what it is. So I need to read off what this thing is. And this plus of PI of G2 minus one, I, I, I can also call generalized minus. And from this, right? So I can solve this equation and then from in this way, and then from this, I uh, can recover the, uh, the object of, again, of Hopf algebra, which is called the antipode, which is again, the generalized minus, which is tells me what is the, what is the momentum, what is the inverse momentum operator, right? I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm uh, pretty careful here, denoting uh, the, the total moment, the eigenstate, the eigenvalue by P, and uh, and uh, using calligraphic calligraphic letters for the for the operators so as to distinguish them okay and then for this and this are actually in one to one correspondence with one with one another okay good so now we are done with we are done with momentum sector but uh, the next hurdle which is by far more complicated is actually to implement is to implement Lorentz transformations. And in order to implement Lorentz transformations, we use the theory of Ivasava decomposition, which is extremely beautiful, beautiful and useful theory in this context. Ivasava decomposition, you remember perhaps what is the Cartan decomposition. Essentially, if you have, essentially, if you have, say, the Lorentz group, it can be decomposed into boosts and rotations and rotations commute among themselves and the boost with rotation could give you boost, but the boost with boost gives you, uh, gives you rotation back. So this is kind of a Cartan decomposition structure, which decomposes the algebra into two sectors, but these sectors actually are not, in the Cartan case, are not the sub-algebras themselves. So the boost, the commutator of boost is not a boost, but it's, it's rotation. And if I saw the composition is something which is uh, uh, kind of contemporary, uh, complementary to the to Cartan decomposition, it decomposes the group into, into the, uh, uh, the Lie uh, Lie group in the product of two Lie groups. And in the case of the, so if I start with the, if I start with the, the Sitter group, SO41, it can be decomposed into A and 3, which is my momentum space. And it decompose and, and the second factor is SO31, which is just a Lorentz group. So I use this structure to define what does it mean to apply the Lorentz transformation in my context. Okay, so what does it mean to apply Lorentz transformation to this uh, to the to momentum? And how you do it, you do it in the following way. The if I have a decomposition, if I have a theory is telling me that if I have an element lambda of SO31 and element G of A and 3, then a this produces for me the, an element of SO41, and the same element can be uniquely decomposed in opposite order, of course, with some different matrices. Okay? And, yes. Yeah, K, yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't, well, not really. I mean, at least from the textbook I learned about it, they use the name for, for explicitly, I mean, uh, Vilenkin and Klimik use the name Ivasava decomposition exactly for this, for this thing. So indeed, yeah, so, so it is uh, non-compact and you know that at least locally the, 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 the uniqueness theorem of Ivasava holds. So, so uh, given any group element of SO41, it can be uniquely decomposed into, in these two ways. And of course, well, you can, you can really explain, uh, as I will show you in a moment, you can explain, you can show, you can see it explicitly. All right, so my definition is, let G prime be the, the, the Lorentz transformation of G. Okay, this is my definition of Lorentz transformation. Let me just work out if this definition of what are the what are the consequences of this definition? If this definition gives you a sensible uh, uh, sensible condition, so what do I do? So let me apply this uh, again to the simple case. 
This is the Lorentz matrix. This is A and 3 matrix. This is my momentum space. Uh, I know that this is, it has this form. And this is, again, some Lorentz matrix. And indeed, if I actually use, well, I, what for, from the point of view of, of uh, relation with Hopf algebra and Kappa Poincare algebra, I just need to, have to use only infinitesimal uh, transformations. So this is the Lorentz matrix for infinitesimal transformation. This is my momentum space matrix uh, with this, uh, you know, this coordinates and momentum space. The stars are not relevant. And then what you find, you do the calculation and you find that can be written in this form. And then this coefficient can be actually uniquely, well, according to, uh, well, but you can check according to Ivasova theorem, but or you can check it explicitly. This, all these coefficients can be actually, can be actually computed. All right, so if you look at this, you will find that the Lorentz transformation, this is the boost along the first axis. You look at this, this is an infinitesimal transformation, but it doesn't matter. You, you see immediately the components of these guys, of, of these this four components of the momenta actually transform as, transform as Lorentz vector. And you can, of course, check it in general case if you like, but, but okay, we, it's completely clear from this. Uh, P4 is a Lorentz scalar, which is also nice because P4 is then, P4 then is related to the Casimir. Uh, okay, and uh, what is essential, well, I, I will not use this explicitly, but let me stress that uh, for, for the calculation, it is, it is pretty important to realize that this column is not changed by the multiplication of this matrix from the right. So the action of this matrix from the right does not change this column. So in, you can really forget if you, for example, want to compute the uh, uh, momentum of some Lorentz boosted state, you, can, you may completely forget about this thing. All right, okay, good. So, and in general, you can write it that uh, for general boost, infinitesimal, you can actually compute this matrix lambda G, which is lambda G, remember, is this matrix. So you can compute this component explicitly uh, in, in, the general, in the case of general boost. I use just the, the boost along the one axis, which is, of course, I can do it because of rotational invariance, but, uh, well, in general, you can actually do the calculation. Okay, good. So uh, now I need to know how to know what the Lorentz symmetry is. And what are the properties of Lorentz symmetry? And uh, okay, this is a little bit more tricky than the than the uh, hop structure of uh, than the hop structure of the of the you know, momentum sector. But essentially, what I'm using I'm using this I'm using this condition. So if I measure a momenta of the boosted or Lorentz transformed state, which is by definition this, this is P mu of G prime times uh, the state G prime. Okay, so I can use this thing. And this is, this defines for me how the, how the Lorentz transformation act on the, act on the one part, on the one particle state. But of course, what I want to understand is how the Lorentz transformation acts on the, on the multi-particle states. And then the, uh, and then you do it in the following, you again use, make use of the Ivasava decomposition. So if I have an element GH, okay, then by general rule, lambda acting of, of Lorentz from the left on the element GH, which is the total momentum of the two particle state, it gives me the total momentum prime times some matrix. And then you can play a little bit to write it in this form. And the first thing that you actually see immediately is that the momentum of the Lorentz boosted state is not the momentum of the product of the individual state boosted. So P mu of G H prime is not P mu of G prime times H prime, which means that clearly said, tells you that the action of Lorentz symmetry is not Leibnizian. Okay, so what it is, well, again, you use this matrices. That's why this, this is so, so easy and so nice. You don't really need to do anything 
uh, but just to play a little bit with simple matrices. And then you find that in the, for the infinitesimal boost, uh, because it turns out that most, uh, the rotations are trivially realized, so, so the rotations are purely classical, for the total moment, uh, the total momentum of the boosted two particle system is given by the original one plus some additional terms. One term, so, so first I have the uh, boost action on the first, there is a boost action on the second, accompanied by some uh, uh, multiplication by some phase transformation of the first, and then uh, there is also the, the rotation. So the if I actually boost the two particle state, not only I boosted the particles, the individual particles, but I also rotate them a little bit. And from this, you can actually read the you can actually read the coproduct of the coproduct of the boost. Right. So the last thing I really need is to find out what is the antipod, and I must confess that I spent last I don't know three or four weeks uh, chatting to everybody who wanted to, uh, to find what is, the, what is the nice physical representation of what antipodes for Lorentz generators should be. And this is something that I came with, which is perhaps not the ideal, uh, ideal thing, uh, but uh, well, it essentially illustrates the idea or it illustrates some axiom of, well, you can say it illustrates an axiom of of algebra. So suppose I have a two particle system and suppose that each, that, uh, uh, that each particle has exactly the same momentum, then, then the uh, uh, blue will, uh, arrow indicates the total momentum. Then if I boost them, so I boost somehow the, the first, I boost, I boost the second, well, the, there will be some changes because of the coproduct. So, so I, I didn't care to really make, uh, make it precise and, and, and clear, so, but I boost the two particles and then the total, the total momentum of them is getting boosted as well. Now, the question that Antipode answers is the following. Suppose I boost one particle with the boost and the second particle with the anti-boost, and this anti-boost is defined in such a way that the total momentum doesn't change. And then, so this is the idea, basically, as compared to how we had before, right? We had this one, and now the antipod is defined in such a way that the, I boosted here the first particle, that I anti-boost the second particle, oh, thanks, and the total momentum actually doesn't change. And this is the expression, so using this, you can actually compute what the antipod is. So let me actually speed up a little bit. Uh, so, all right. So, so, so basic, basic lesson uh, is that uh, the whole of kapo poincare algebra can be determined by just by using the group theory of momentum space manifold. Uh, 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 the notion of coproduct antipod are necessary to construct field theoretical models. And in turn, if I have a field theory, there might be some cosmological, some phenomenological consequences of this theory, which can be perhaps uh, uh, confronted with observations or experiments. Okay, so let me turn to this. I don't have much time. Uh, all right, so uh, the field theoretical, so, so this is this is couple Poincare phenomenology very briefly. And so, so let me just flash for you the uh, ingredients. I, I would love to discuss it if anybody is interested to move about more details to talk about more, to, to, to tell you about more details later. Basically uh, with this uh, composition, momentum composition, uh, you can uh, translate the momentum composition into, okay. So g given the non-trivial momentum space, using this Majit idea, this corresponds to non-commutative manifold, but instead of working on non-commutative manifold, I choose to work with the star product and the star product is defined this way. So I can define star product for plane waves in exactly these waves. And well, so, and I work with it. Then I define the field. I define an on shell field and uh, a joint field in this way. Then I produce the action 
which has this form, there is some kind of free parameter that I adjust in order to have it, to have the theory Lorentz invariant in the precise sense that I'm gonna discuss in a moment. So I have this action. From the action, what I can check, well, the first thing I compute from the action is symplectic form. The symplectic form is this one, which translates into Poisson brackets or commutators. So let me don't distinguish between the two. So uh, strictly speaking, this are, this are Poisson bracket because the algebra of creation annihilation operator in this context, uh, quantum mechanically is not really well understood. So think about, think about this as Poisson brackets really. Uh, and then what you can do, hey, given the symmetry and given the, and given the symplectic form, you can actually use, uh, something which is called covariant phase space method to compute all the charges, conserve charges or the net charges of the theory, and you can do it. So you compute these star charges and there are 10 of them, not surprisingly, uh, there is the, there are four momenta, so Hamiltonian and three linear momenta, there is a boost charge, there is a rotation charge, and actually you find, well, they have, you know, there is this antipode here, so, so they, the expression for them is not totally the same as it is, as it is in the case of, in the, in the standard case, but the difference are not that big. Uh, the Poisson bracket of charges form a, form a, form a representation uh, of the standard Poincaré algebra. So he, since you know what the Poisson brackets are, you can actually compute it. Uh, the Poisson bracket of the charges and then you find that they satisfy the standard Poincaré algebra and these charges are generators of the thermal translation boosts and rotations. And in this sense, I'm saying that theory is Lorentz invariant. I mean, the theory is Lorentz invariant in, the, uh, in my here, since it possesses a number at 10 in conserved uh, charges, which are associated with Lorentz symmetry. But this theory possesses something which is actually much uh, more interesting and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and potentially phenomenologically relevant, it possesses a kind of a slightly of a slight or non, kind of non-trivial violation of CPT symmetry, in particular the C symmetry. So if you define the C operator, which is the operator which translates from particle to antiparticle states, there are two, there are two sets of, because the, the field is complex, then there are particles, the, complex and antiparticles and the C operator essentially translates from one particle state to one antiparticle state and vice versa. And then you do the computation and you find explicitly that the commutator of Poisson brackets, uh, the commutator of Poisson bracket of uh, the C charge and the boost is not zero. So although particle, I'm talking only in massive case. So although the particles and antiparticles they have identical masses when they are at rest. If you boost them by the same amount of boost, they actually getting a diff slightly different momentum. Okay, there is, uh, well, I don't want to spend much time on that. Uh, there is a kind of a puzzle here. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, which, is, which is the Yost Greenberg theorem because, uh, well, you know that there is this very powerful theorem, which essentially says that if you have CPT invariant theory, uh, uh, is CPT violating theory, it cannot be Lorentz invariant. And uh, this thing, what I, what I presenting seems to be an explicit contradiction to that. On the other hand, it really depends very much on how you define the Lorentz symmetry. And you can trace explicitly what fails here is that, uh, I'm, I, as I said, the charges, we have the, the algebra of charges, but on the other hand, if you start computing the Whiteman functions, you find that the Whiteman functions are explicitly uh, not Lorentz invariant, which is exactly the reason why this theorem fails because the Lorentz invariant of, of Whiteman function is essentially the essential uh, part of the proof here. Anyway, uh, let me return to phenomenology. As I said, I have a par, if I have a pair of a, of a, of a, of a, of a particle and antiparticle at rest, then if I boost them by the same amount of boost, and uh, they get slightly different momentum and energy. This is how it comes. Uh, so if I have one, I measure, I boost the particle along first axis say with the boost psi, I measure the momentum and energy of it. 
and I find this expression for the antiparticle. I find this expression, and these expressions are slightly different. The difference between them is so for the p squared of a kappa. Well, p squared now is the linear momentum. It's tiny, but it's still something. And then uh, just by using this, you can actually try to figure out if there are any, if there are any phenomenological consequences of this. And uh, well, one of the things that we thought of was the, uh, uh, was the fact that the decay rate of particles and antiparticles should be slightly different at very high energies, uh, which is pretty naive. So we did a little kind of a uh, naive calculation, which surprisingly gives you already a pretty good constraint, uh, which is that just from the muons at LHC, you find the bound on kappa because you don't see, of course, this effect. The bound on kappa is 10 to 14. Well. If it bound of kappa was 10 to 2 GeV, then it wasn't very interesting. If it was 10 of 25, it would kill the theory, theory immediately. But this is kind of a nice value and it can be improved. I mean, for sorry, in the future accelerators, you can improve it by a couple of orders of magnitude. And uh, well, if you have a more dedicated machine, it can be probably improved also by one on one or two orders of magnitude. There is also kind of uh, of a count phenomenology, a neutral count phenomenology that we are working right now, uh, and but, but we don't have final results. So uh, I, I just can say that they might be for for count and anti count. They might be effect of the same of the same order of magnitude. Uh, so giving more or less the same bound the same bound on cup of using the using current. Uh, current technology. Well, that's everything. I think I am well in time. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yurek. Very nice talk. Questions? Okay. You were you first, second, third. Hi, uh, can you show again the page where you wrote the com canonical commutation relations? Uh, field theory. Uh, you mean yeah, this one? Exactly. Yeah. So is this algebra, is this a co-module algebra on the Kappa Poincaré? Uh, so is it consistent with the non-trivial co-product? That, that's my question. Like I asked yesterday. Uh, uh, that's a that's a very good question. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the problem is I really cannot uh, I really cannot answer it because in order to be able to answer it, I really need to know um, the, 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 the what the, the Fox pay what, what the multiparticle states of identical particles are. Right? But, I really but, but it's defined in this. So the aq aq prime do they commute or is that? A Q A Q uh, sorry A Q A Q prime that, yes they come yes yeah okay but then then it's you know, usually when you have a non-trivial co-product such an algebra is not consistent so is, is Kappa Poincaré triangular or quasi triangular oh uh, well it certainly is not triangular yeah so then it, I, I it seems unlikely that this is consistent with the co-action that's what I asked uh, no that, that's exactly that's exactly what I uh, what my answer was yeah, okay. the problem is. That in order to really to, to, to judge if it's consistent, you really need to have uh, to apply it on the multiparticle states, right? You really need to have a Fox space construction first in order That's to. What it gives you. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Because the problem is that you really need to understand how to act with the AQ on the on the on on the, on, the, on, the, on Fox states. And us, and there is a paper coming, and essentially, uh, and essentially the idea is. Uh, that there is no real, uh, there is no real Fox space construction for that. So this is just, uh, so this thing should be understood only on the class, uh, as I already stressed, it should be understood like, like uh, uh, in terms of Poisson, uh, of Poisson algebra, we have a good handle of one particle states, but we don't have uh, any handle on multi-particle states uh, and the whole of the Fox space. So, so the question, I, I understand the, the relevance of your question, but at this point, I, I cannot even say if 
the answer is uh, it doesn't work, or if the answer is it couldn't work because the whole of construction is not available in a standard way. Okay. I would be surprised if it worked. Let me know. <laughs> okay, I would do. I have a few small questions. The first is, is this algebra quasi triangular? Uh, uh, you mean the couple of Poncare? Uh. Is it? Is there a break group or it is? It is. The, there is a classical Ramat. So there's no problem in symmetrizing and anti symmetrizing using this break group. Uh, so yes, there is a problem of some of making sense of symmetrizing and anti symmetrizing. This is exactly the point of the paper I mentioned. It's coming. We didn't really agree yet on, on the meaning of this, but the point the but the message that I can tell you at this moment is that the standard Fox space construction doesn't work. The question is how you interpret it. But we can replace SN, the permutation group, by the break group. And uh, I mean, break group is the. Uh, uh, not really, not really, because there are many more. No, 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 no. Of course, you can replace uh, the. Uh, uh, the permutation group by the braid group, but this is not everything that you need. What you need, you need to construct the two particle state, for example, and the two particle state must satisfy some, some properties. For example, it must transform covariantly under Lorentz transformation. Or the braided state, so if you flip the state, might have this exactly the same momentum as the original one. And these conditions are not really easy to satisfy. We managed to satisfy it. But the basic message of what the, the technically we find that given, given a state, there are infinitely many uh, distinct braided state, so switched state. There are infinite, it's like onions, essentially. So you can have infinitely many ways you can actually to switch the order, giving different states, such as which transform covariantly under Lorentz as the original one, and have exactly the same momentum, right? And at this moment, we don't really, well, I, I would love to discuss it with you, Bal, if, okay. if, you, if you want, but uh, at this moment, we have no clue really how to interpret it. Okay. The related question is, your momenta are not adding for two particle states. No, then they're not abelian. But there are very strong experimental evidence about addition of momenta, and it is used in LFC for analysis of data. Uh, yes, uh, but the, at energies, which are at energies, which are order of what? Uh, uh, than well, energy, 100 well, GeV, right? TV, so. Well, but we expect the deviation is of, will be at the level of, say, uh, close to the Planck energies, which is uh, at the level of, I don't know, 10 to 16, 10 to 17. So this is one of the things that actually this, uh, uh, that actually this uh, story about the decay rates is telling you that this kappa is bounded from the current, from the current observation that it's bounded by say 10 to 14 GeV. And of course, we know at LHC that at energy center of mass energy of something like 10 to 2 GeV, mm -hmm. it's perfectly okay, but it's well, well below the, the scale that is relevant for that. Mm. What about causality? Oh, uh, that's extremely good question. So the answer is that, uh, well, that uh, well, there was some analysis. The first analysis, it, it's hard, you know, it's it's hard technically. So there is a paper by uh, Arzano and Consoli, right? What was this name of his student? Consoli, whatever. That there is a paper of three or four years back, uh, which in a slightly different uh, scale field model actually discusses this. So it, it comp they compute explicitly the two point functions and this part, they discuss the causal properties. And, and again, I don't know, you should look at it. I mean, of course, everything becomes the light count becomes fuzzy and the causality is kind of fuzzy causality. But, mm, well, you know, so, so, so technically, so some results are there. But again, the interpretation, the physical interpretation of this result uh, is, not that, is not that easy. This is one of the top of my list project that I'm gonna start now. Okay, a related question, last one and then it's dropped, okay. Is that the CPT operator mm -hmm. in the in and out states are different in normal scattering theory. Okay. 
and it is very important to define scattering because CPT symmetry means that they are living in the same Hilbert space. So you can take scalar products of in and out space mm -hmm. and get an S matrix. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if CPT is broken, as in your case, mm -hmm. I would not know how to make an identification of in and out states and how to take scalar products. So I would imagine that there is a problem in defining S matrix. For example, I, 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 well, again, uh, this whole field, I mean, the, 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 the field theoretical applications are extremely hard technical, which means that at this moment, uh, to my knowledge, there is, I don't think we really have the inter really interacting model. We, we just have a free field model. That's why I'm happy to have just one particle state because that is, well, I can, at least I can learn something. Uh, so we don't have a multi-particle multi -particle states. We don't have interacting model. Uh, you can naively compute, say, you know, some loop diagrams, but it's far, far away from, from uh, as much. But of course, I, I, I know about it and I keep it in back for my right. There was a, a third question. I Is think it, it went from there. Yeah, make it quick, please, because we are a bit late. Yeah, I will make it quick uh, because you've partly answered my question when you said that you don't know how to do multi-particle states. Uh, my comment is that uh, if you are looking for phenomenological signatures from single particle states, then they will almost certainly arise close to the Planck scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will have to spend a long time and a lot of money before we can see these signatures. But if you can develop your multi-particle technology, then you have other places to look for. For example, you may want to look for limits on the Chandrasekhar mass. Yeah, sure. It's statistical uh, mechanics. Yes. yes of so course. you will be able to take advantage of quantum That's statistics. True. Yeah. Because That's otherwise, like I said, you will have to wait for a very long time and spend a lot of money before you can even see anything. Right. Okay. So let me comment on this because it's important point. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not that good uh, as it seemed, uh, as you would think naively to be. The problem is that if I have a multi-particle state, so like, uh, you know, if I think about statistical mechanics and I consider the many, many particles, uh, no, not even in this quantum sense, just in the classical sense, just statistical mechanics, then the problem is that the effective deformation scale is getting smaller and smaller with the number of constituents. So if I consider macroscopic bodies, the effective deformation scale for macroscopic body is actually by, by many, many orders of magnitude smaller than this kappa, which I presume might be of order of black mass. On the other hand, so, so the statistical mechanics is of course extremely interesting question, but uh, I wouldn't be that optimistic that even if I was able to do some real calculations, if this effect, you know, or, 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 or of the the, the the deformation scales goes down, go, goes smaller and smaller relatively, uh, mm, uh, would actually uh, would actually make it easy to to see some effects. On the other hand, you know, this kappa being bigger than ten to fourteen is actually pretty good. It's we are just five orders of magnitude off uh, the Planck scale. Right, and uh, this is just by picking up data, random data from LHC. So, uh, and you know, the first thing that we 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 thought of. So, so I believe that there might be there might be some circumstances in which this effect might be actually pretty close to the threshold of what we of what we can actually measure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let's thank our thank speaker you. again. Hello? Yes. Okay, yeah. Let me see. Okay. So our second speaker for this morning session is uh, another Jurek Lukierski. <laughs> we are very happy to have him uh, here. And uh, he is going to tell us about quantum deformed phase spaces with non-commutative coordinates and momenta. 
Yes, pointer is here. Yeah. And to go back to yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so I'm very glad to be again in contact. I enjoy very much this place. Thank you very much, George. Uh, so this is the plan of my talk. Uh, in the introduction, I'm going to say some simple things that if you have a, a quantum phase space, then you have a, just a standard canonical one and quantum deformed. But this quantum deformed is important when you um, uh, wish to, to include quantum gravity effects. <clears throat> now I'm going to, on the, in the second um, uh, part, these two things uh, about the kappa deformed the quantum phase space and Snyder uh, quantum phase space are just uh, a kind of small review of the things which are, are known in the literature. A new stuff is here. Namely, I'm going to say about some new concept of introducing spontaneous Lorentz symmetry breakage into Snyder model. And we are just now in the process of discussion and probably writing together the paper with uh, uh, Stepan Melianat and Salvatore, who is sitting there, and still Aya Pahu. So, so it's, it's related with the following fact, I mean, this, this um, concept that, that usually when you have extended Snyder model, there is um, what introduces, so to say, from, um, by, by some, some kind of ansatz, the existence of some algebra. And here, if you have spontaneous Lorentz symmetry, you, everything is just defined in the algebra of, of uh, Snyder model. After I say about the young quantum phase space, so this case here is just in, the, in this case, you have a uh, non commutative coordinates and commutative momenta. Here, you have both non commutative. I will also mention here about so called triple special relativity model, which is Somewhat looks a little bit similar like Young, and uh, this was in 2004, uh, I think, uh, proposed by Jurek and, uh, uh, and Liz Morin, yes. Now, uh, at the end, I'll say about the supersymmetric extensions. By the way, if you read the abstract in, in, the, in, the, in the list of abstracts, <laughs> I'm exposing much more this super discussion, but uh, because I, <clears throat> one year ago, <clears throat> I, I, I was speaking at, at the, at the uh, call for meeting about the super extensions. So this will be just mentioned at the outset. Uh, and <clears throat> so let me just pass to the, uh, I should press properly. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so, so as an introduction, as I said, the three-phase space algebra framework, and first one is the classical one for classical theories. You have a commuting phase space variable. There is another uh, set of theories which are the standard quantum theories, uh, basically quantum mechanics and standard quantum field theory. When you introduce canonically quantized phase space coordinates. Uh, but the uh, the subalgebra the KB coordinates and mm, uh, the the uh, the coordinates and the momenta are just uh, are, they remain commutative. Now, if you want to take into consideration the presence of quantum gravity effect. Then the you have to introduce non commutative axes, and you have a non canonical quantum deformed phase spaces. In general, you can write just as algebra the following uh, set of equations, where this is a generalization of Heisenberg algebra, where you have non commutative axes and non, non commutative p's. Of course, if you have a commuting phase space variables, this h is equal to zero. So now let me say about the case when you have a commutative momenta. So as I said, it's hemi mu is equal to zero. So you have the such type of algebra. 
and you can solve right away. So you have a X dash, which is non-commutative, and P without dash is, is just the standard P classical. So you have the following relation between the uh, non-commutative axis and commutative axis. So, so this is just a simple modification of the of the canonical phase algebra. It appears that in this case, because in this algebra uh, you have a, a one of the terms which which we, which we have on the right hand side is just the canonical term. This is kind of a deformation of the canonical term. So you have a constant term. So you cannot uh, fit in this kind of structure into the into the Hopf algebra. Uh, framework, but you can introduce so called Hopf algebraic structure, which is uh, differs firstly comparing with Hopf algebra. Who is doing this? Uh, my phone? Yeah, it's my phone, then I will put on your on your before you. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so, so you use just this the 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 the, the canonical uh, coproduct for B algebraic uh, is just non-symmetric. So, uh, so in that case, you can use this this scheme into B algebraic scheme in, in a kind of Hopf algebraic structure because you can define this non-commutative axis which are here, which is a closed mm -hmm. algebra. Uh, as so-called base algebra of a B algebraic H. This is, you know, the list of the operations is much larger in the case of Hopf algebra because you have the subalgebra A, which is the base algebra, and there are two a mapping, source mapping and target map. And this, um, uh, this makes difference if you want to have a coalgebra because uh, if you want to introduce coproduct in, in, in for for Hopf, Hopf algebra, then you have to introduce um, a different way of of tensoring, which is uh, uh, was introduced by Takeuchi in 1977. And if you insist on using usual uh, tensor product, then then you have uh, inside of this framework so uh, a kind of coproduct gauge, gauge freedom. So Takeuchi is like a kind of gauge invariant uh, object, and this are the, the this is the full space, and uh, it's 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 divide this this is obtained from this by dividing by some ideal. Okay, so now let's pass to the kappa deformed quantum phase space. I'm going to speak about how it has a Hopf algebraic structure. So in this case. Um, this F, which is on this relation on, on previous transparency, uh, the commutator XX is, is the following, where this constant for vectors introduced, if you want to embrace in one formula, uh, known types of uh, kappa deformations, because this A mu shows you the direction in which you perform kappa deformation. So in standard case, this direction is a tie. So, so, so it means the, the, the really quantum in, in standard capital definition are, are time variable and the, the, the space variables are not. But you can have a light called kappa deformation. Also, there is possibility of using so called tachyonic kappa deformation where, where A mu is purely spatial. spatial. Um, so, the function describing um, uh, kappa deformed non economical non non computation relations <clears throat> are given by the following choice of this function g mu nu. Now, I would like here to mention that uh, that if you want to use the formalism of Hopf algebra, then it's important that this base algebra is closed subalgebra. But for example, if you use the so called theta mu nu deformed uh, axis, here you have a a numerical factor. So it means that uh, uh, this property is not satisfied because, because if this belongs to X, numbers do not belong to X because it's, so, so in this case, uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot have a, a algebraic 
structure if you just use this X uh, and P. So the, the, there, are, there are some papers where we were discussing the kappa deformation. Also, the, the theta mu nu deformation is in this paper. Uh, now I would like to say also that if you wish to to have a Hopf algebraic structure, then uh, in the case of theta mu nu deformation, then you simply you should consider the whole uh, Poincaré algebra and its dual. So this is the Poincaré algebra, this is dual the Poincaré group. And now if you uh, include the whole Poincaré algebra, uh, sorry, if you introduce whole uh, Poincaré group as a base manifold, so you so you obtain um, you can you can obtain the the, the Hopf algebraic structure and to use so-called Heisenberg double construction. Uh, so this is kind of semi-direct product of this two Hopf algebra. Two al one is quantum group, one is quantum uh, algebra. Now we pass to the Snyder quantum phase space. Now, what is from this point of view the generalization? I mean, conceptual generalization that you pass from a closed algebra to the algebra which depends on extra momentum variables. So, of course, it's, you cannot make out of it a, a Hopf algebraic structure because this algebra of excess is not closed. Uh, so, uh, you keep commuting P, P, P news. This I speak about the, the, the Snyder quantum phase space. So, you add to this excess this peak, which is here, uh, which is commuting. And uh, you get similar relation uh, describing the XP relations. Uh, so, as I mentioned here, it's, uh, because X is not a subalgebra, then uh, then um, you cannot have the Hopf algebraic structure. Uh, now, Snyder quantum space uh, provides just a concrete example of this general structure. Uh, there is a because X and X uh, has two uh, length dimensions, and mu nu is has a dimension zero, so G has a dimension of uh, 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 so so G has a dimension one over m square. Now, when you pass, uh, when you define in such a way uh, a, a fourth dimension, I mean, or rather a fifth, because I'm passing here. In the case of of m mu nu, then mu nu is equal from zero to three, and here you add uh, index four. And this 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 embed so to say this uh, this this algebra uh, into uh, this this algebra embeds into the the Sitter algebra. So this is the the the, the equal for relative the covariance relation. So this is by the way and first example I, I would say quite prominent example of a of a uh, four-dimensional relativistic covariance relations for non commutative axes. Uh, now one can introduce um, also here uh, one, uh, when one introduces the the, the uh, canonical phase then you can express this in terms of x, I mean non commutative x and p, just in such a way because x, uh, uh, x quantum deformed is proportional just to x. So you have the following uh, formulas or this, and, and you, can, uh, you can realize the, the Snyder quantum space time just using this g mu nu, which is consistent with, uh, with uh, Jacobi identities. Uh, so the uh, <clears throat> this is this relation here, which um, uh, describes you this this, this G mu nu. and uh, now I am mentioning that 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 uh, this is just the, the the kind of description of the situation, which is in Snyder paper. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be uh, forty-seven, not seventy-four. Okay. Um, now, if you if you assume that the commutation relations are, are the following, then you can show that if you introduce a particular local functional relation between uh, this 
this this two functions f and, and, and k i mean in the following way where f prime is, is just a derivative then then you have also consistent jacobi identity by the way the snyder choice is just that this function f is equal one and k is equal one So now I'm passing to this part where, where there are some new concepts. <clears throat> uh, so uh, as I said, uh, you, can, you can embed the, the, the Snyder model into the, into the equal for the sitter O for one the algebra. And now I think there is here some. You see, if you, if you look at the book on quantum mechanics, then you have the following relation. Well, so you see, there is there stays the Planck constant H. So one can, if you have, for example, the relations for, for so I, I call it like, like this. So if you remember, right. Uh, a relation for Lorentz algebra. So there is a kind of quantum mechanical um, basis which contains H, which will, will be just equal I H and this four terms which are here. So uh, the idea here is just to expose the dependence on H of the of the whole system. So if you expand the in this case, the sitter, uh, the sitter generator into the power expansions, then uh, there is a question, what does it mean this uh, term, which is a classical part of this operator? So in general case, this provides you just the new space, which is the limit of MAB, H goes to zero uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, in quantized theory, then this XAB can be also obtained as a um, vacuum expectation value of this operator. And in this way, you introduce in a Snyder model the concept of spontaneously uh, symmetry breaking uh, for, for Lorentz algebra. So, so you get so called tensorial Goldstone, uh, the, the Sitter mode. This way has been already studied. Uh, for example, by people interested, interested in, in Lorentz symmetry breaking in, in elementary particle physics. I think maybe you, you heard this name Kosteletsky, who is a kind of leader of discussing this, this, this breaking of, um, of Lorentz symmetry. So he's considering the, the so say the real breaking, I mean, or, or, and, and, and spontaneous. So spontaneous is based on the, on this, on this uh, limit, h going to zero, and in this case, m, if, 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 if operator m is, does not here, for example, if this term is not as absent, then you don't have a spontaneous symmetry break. Mm. So now, uh, if you con consistently add, oops, if you consistently add, mm, uh, to the uh, this i to this uh, basic relation for the for the um, Snyder model. So now you can write uh, you can use this uh, this uh, this h expansion into calculating uh, uh, just uh, just the co the correction, the first correction, second correction, so on. So for the first correction, you get the following set of equations. I'm sorry, but here it's, uh, I should have small x. And I think I, I, I was looking in the morning. Ah, okay, and there it should be with or with one. So there's a small mistake, but I didn't want uh, to, to, to change the thing which I sent to, uh, to this um, bank of, 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 of transparency. So, so these two things. Are, but it's just exactly expansion. I'm, I'm, I'm just, um, because there are, there are three things. There is this relation, uh, so, so the basic side the relation, 
Lorentz covariance relations, Lorentz algebra relations. So you introduce this expansion into these relations, and from these equations you get uh, higher orders, and it's bigger than one, and it, it can uh, it can uh, you can realize that it is not enough to have those x's, which are just uh, just these are just the, the, the uh, commuting uh, variables. You have to add still the the dual momenta. So this is the algebra where x's here are just these things obtained from the spontaneous symmetry breaking, and um, p is just the the, the, the the dual to the to those x's. And in this case, from this set of equations, you get in first order of age the standard formula for generators. So, so here, so m is equal to h times this. Um, x, I, I should anti symmetrize, of course, x nu and p nu, and I should anti symmetrize nu and nu here. <clears throat> but uh, because from how you get this extra variables, so this. Um, uh, this you have to take into consideration M. But what is interesting that this orbital formula, this is this this is this it, it deals here with the usual XP, but here also deals with this additional tensorial coordinates, which are related with the limit h going to zero of Lorentz generators. So in this way you can look for also for iterative terms um, uh, for, for x mu. Uh, so uh, you obtain uh, this object as a function of, of this extended canonical systems. And <clears throat> you can show that they, there should be, if you have index n here, then there should be a linear in the momenta. So in particular, you get the following uh, formula for the first order for x. Which is, as you see, it's linear in the momentum. By the way, this this uh, expansion, this, this type of expansion, without uh, saying that you expand, you you expand in in, in Planck constant, but you you expand in some, I would say, deformation parameter from abelian algebra to to non-abelian algebra. So so this, they they were first used by uh, Marian Arts and his collaborators. <coughs> And now, uh, very recently, we, we are in uh, contact with, with, with the group of uh, Stefan Manianat. Uh, and uh, uh, it means that we, we like to make, so to say, more physical the way he presents the, 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 the power theory expansion in the case of extended Snyder model. Now, there's a remark that you can extend also the, the, the extended Snyder model by adding to this uh, part, which is just pure uh, Snyder model, also the, the, the kappa deformation. So you have, you have here uh, both um, terms, and there is a modification of the covariance relation. And this, this formula has been introduced by Marianats and, uh, and Miniemi in. Uh, I mean, last year in 21. And uh, <clears throat> also, if you make this iterative expansion uh, in, in parameter H, you can solve another, in an analogous way this model. Now, I'm passing now to the, uh, to the Young model, which is interesting. It, is, it appeared just in the same year. Uh, when Snyder, uh, here I, 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 as you see, I'm putting properly 1947. Uh, so he, so to say, applied twice the trick of Snyder, because what did Snyder? He, he, he added to Lorentz algebra one dimension, describing non-commutative axis. And he will add this and this, and this another dimension, Adds non commutative piece. And if you look at the, at the algebraic relation, this is the Snyder relation, but you have also this relation and this relation. But if you use the group theoretical way of deriving it, then you obtain here an operator, not usually this, 
gives you this with h, which is the Planck constant. But here you get some scalar h, which is a kind of operator, operator valued extension of the Planck constant's h in the, in the, in the canonical relations. So, so uh, this h, which, uh, which is this operator <coughs> extension of, of the Planck constant, enters into the following commutators which describes internal O2 rotations of the, of the multiplet of space time and for a moment, uh, for random multiplet. <clears throat> now it's interesting that this model is, is um, invariant, covariant, I'm sorry, under the so-called Born map, which is described by the following replacement. Here in the case of H, you just change the sign for this operator H, and you change R into, into kappa. <clears throat> so one can say one can say that quantum uh, phase uh, young quantum phase space algebra uh, is born self dual because it's covariant under this Born map. Uh, there is a comment, of course. I'm, I'm here playing with models, but there is a there, there is a possibility. The following possibility that if you put <coughs> M, I mean for the Snyder model equal to Planck mass, um, and, the, uh, and, and to introduce R as a radius of universe, I'm just showing that, that the deformation parameter in uh, first equation is M squared, in second is R squared. This is the mass light. And this is the length light. Yeah? So if this M is a Planck mass, and if this R square is a, is a radius of the universe, then you end up with the following uh, LA, uh, concept that, <clears throat> that uh, one obtains the link between the physics at Planck distance and the cosmological distance. This idea is not a new one. But, uh, for example, it has been uh, proposed by Zeldovich, I think, first, also, also studied by, by Dirac. Now, this is just a remark that if you describe, um, if you just use the, 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 the Citer algebras, so in one case, you use the Citer algebras with, uh, with inhomogeneous paths describing x variables. And in this case, the p variables. So now this other, these two algebras are the subalgebras of the equal uh, five DS algebra, which is the way of introducing, uh, so to say, the Young model, another way of introducing the Young model. Now I'm passing to, 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 to another model, which is related with this kind of phase spaces. So <clears throat> as I uh, mentioned, Eurek and this morning, they have uh, introduced the following relations. And instead of going in a geometric way like Young, they went just in algebraic, pure algebraic way uh, uh, in order to, to, to write this commutator. And they have obtained the following from Jacobi identities, the following right hand side. So now it appears, however, that in this case, one can express m mu nu in the in the in the variables. Uh, so uh, so this m mu nu is, is bilinear in x. So this is the one formula. There is also quite recently alternative formula where instead of commutators, here there's anti-commutators. Another way of describing this model is to introduce this this momenta for 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 o o. Uh, O X for one and O P for one, like this and like this. And now if you write in such a way, then, then you obtain the formula of M mu nu, which is uh, introducing this model. Uh, <clears throat> and you see, if you write like this, then there is, um, because the bond duality means simply replacing M mu nu X by M mu nu P and vice versa. So you obtain from this formula because of the sum the, the, the self-duality relation for the model. Oh, 
Okay, so now I'm already at the end, almost at the end. <clears throat> so I'm going to say about the following two aspects. Uh, first aspect is the supersymmetric extension and the quantum fermionic, fermionic spinos. So the, the Snyder type model is based on, on, the, on, the in, on, on introducing the cosset generators uh, and introducing uh, just um, the, the, the basis, or I mean the, the generators in this, in this cosset generator are describing um, uh, non commutative space time in the standard uh, Snyder model or non commutative quantum phase, phase generator in the Young model. So now when you take <clears throat> instead of a, in this case, instead of a the algebra is super algebra, you end up with a super symmetric extension of this uh, structure, uh, this, this quantum phase structure. So such example is provided, for example, for the OSP14, which is the, the super algebra describing super symmetrization of D equal for ADS. And uh, you see that if you decompose this, Super algebra into the sum of, of Lorentz sector, I mean, uh, concerning generator as a sum of Lorentz sector, and the generator is the pair of costs, then you see that this Snyderiza Snyderization procedure uh, is here. I mean, this coset, because SP4 is equivalent to, uh, to o o o uh, so, so, so this here you get non commutative excess. But from this, you get non commutative uh, fermionic variables because you, you Snyderize, uh, so, so you promote to the, to the uh, elements of the, of the supersymmetric quantum algebra the generators in this course. So, in this case, <clears throat> uh, you obtain uh, just ADS space time coordinates x nu and quantum deforms. Uh, SP4 fermionic Majorana spinner. And this together, I mean, this X mu and X mu introduces the, the quantum relativistic Snyder super space coordinate. So you, you can, in such a way, similar way, by playing with this idea of replacing generators of the algebra by the non commutative coordinates of the phase space, you can end up with the, with the super extension of the, of the phase spaces. <clears throat> Now, uh, uh, here I'm just mentioning uh, uh, this, these two papers where we were uh, studying this uh, supersymmetric extension. By the way, this archive is just uh, my uh, lecture notes from, from uh, last year. That was, the, that was done uh, at the distance, so to say. And uh, here, I, I, these things which I'm presenting here are just described by much, much more in detail. Now let's continue. There is an interesting thing <clears throat> that you can have a two types of twisters which are non-commutative because you can introduce a quantum bosonic spinner but by introducing a coset of a Lee group uh, and um, and in this case you get you get just the the bosonic Penrose twisters but also it's long long time known because I wrote this paper in 1979 that you can introduce also quantum fermionic twisters but in this case you have to use such a corset so this corset describes you uh, the, the, the fermionic twisters anti commuting so from the point of view of Penrose philosophy, because he has this kind of uh, holomorphicity philosophy for, um, uh, for this spinor coordinate. So, uh, so, so one uses quantum bosonic spinor. But from the point of view of the nature of fermions, twisters, they, they correspond to, to half spin uh, degrees of freedom. So they, they should be uh, rather quantum fermion twisters. So these two possibilities are here described. Now, the last part is just that I, I mentioned of algebraic. Uh, I, I think I have still a few minutes, yeah? Huh? Five, yeah, okay, so, so, so 
so it will be maybe three minutes. Uh, so, uh, so one can introduce always if you have a, uh, if you have Hopf algebra, you can introduce a, a dual Hopf algebra, which if, if H describes to the generalized coordinates, H uh, dual describes the generalized momentum. In such a case, you can introduce the quantum phase space as Hopf algebra described by Heisenberg double. Heisenberg double is, is, is described by such operation where this sign describes particular semi-direct product which is applied to Hopf algebra. It's called in some literature smash product. And now you see that Heisenberg double belongs to algebraic category Hopf algebra. So you have the following sequence of inclusions. The Heisenberg doubles are, 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 are uh, just particular cases of Hopf algebra, and Hopf algebra are particular cases of general quantum phase spaces, which are just uh, derived by the consistency of Jacobi identity. So, for example, the TSR model, I mean, this, this uh, uh, TSR test, this is uh, uh, triple special relativity, this is TSR. This triple special relativity model does not belong neither to Heisenberg double nor to Hopf algebra. So, so it's just a kind of genuine quantum phase space. Because as I mentioned, Jurek used just um, uh, uh, Jacobi identity as the main tool to describe this model. Okay, so this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question? So I would like to know about the Lorentz symmetry breaking. You have introduced some expectation value on the vacuum. Are you introducing Hilbert space or is just a risk? Uh, you see, I mean, uh, uh, Snyder model is, um, is a kind of algebraic model which still has not applications, so to say, to, to real physical situations. It's just... <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> a model describing some, some type of quantum space time, yes? Uh, so, 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 of course, I, I, if, I, if I would use uh, some, uh, some interpretation, then of course I have to define vacuum in that sense that if you write, let us say, this expansion, then of course this vacuum is defined uh, because the first part is classical in this expansion. Where h is equal to zero, yes, but but from this other part, part you define the, the the vacuum when you introduce some case annihilation operators in 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 a consistent way. So I'm 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 not entering into this, but if I would be more specific about this uh, this uh, Snyder model, one has to do it, of course. But uh, this is the general definition of 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 a spontaneous symmetry breaking that that the vacuum. It's not unique. <laughs> we have another question here. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm coughing, but this is not because of COVID. <laughs> uh, so since you mentioned uh, Young's algebra, I just wanted to point out the relation to a talk yesterday by, by doing on the higher spin stuff. So if you, Use Young's construction and use SO4, comma two instead of SO5, comma one. Yeah. And if you choose a particular unitary representation, then you end up precisely with these higher spin gauge theories that Tung was ending up. Yes. So you can actually define a quantum field theory then. Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at the talk yeah. and I had an impression that it, it looks in that sense familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. I will, but I will look again at your paper. No. Any other question? So there is also the so-called coleman mandula operator I don't yes. know, in, in quantum field theory, which is defined for scalar fields, which is basically a translation along the, the mass hyperboloid. But, but excuse me, I interrupt. 
Coleman Mandura is related with, with internal symmetry generators. So, uh, so this so, operator, I mean, if you define it, uh, x mu is, is given in a certain form, it satisfies the Snyder algebra, actually. Yes. And with that, you're already in a quantum field theoretical setting. I, but I never understood why people don't use this operator, to be honest, for Kappa Minkowski. Uh, uh, maybe you can comment on that. You mean Kappa Minkowski? Or, or, you know, any kind of Snyder deformed uh, uh, type algebra. Oh, you mean, this is a oh, you mean operator. Man, uh, Mandula and, uh, and deformed uh, space time, yeah, something like this. If you take the Coleman Mandula operator, it already satisfies Snyder. And it is a physical operator that is defined on, on uh, you know, by using quantum field theory already. So, so of course, know. assuming that you live in the sitter space, yeah. No, no, you no? take Minkowski space, you have the mass hyperboloid, and then basically it's, it's uh, P mu, M mu, nu, symmetrized, divided by M squared. So I, I think from this framework, which uses uh, uh, quantum deformed space time, then, 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 then you cannot pass to Coleman Mandula because Coleman Mandula is based on the S matrix and asymptotic states, yes? The, the, the proof of, 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 of his validity. So I don't know if you, we would have a kind of dynamical model with a kind of S matrix where X would be kind of Snyder-like, then, then maybe, then maybe this your comment would be interesting. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we should go on with the next speaker. So thank you very much uh, for your talk. Gracias. my bon bon. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, last speaker of this uh, morning session before the coffee break, uh, Kilian Hersant, uh, talking about quantum properties of U1 like gauge theories on Kappa Minkowski. So is it is it working? Yes. No, yes. Yes. Okay. Or maybe I can just grab it. Ah, okay. Pointing to my mouse. One, two. No. Or maybe I can just hold it right. One test, okay. Uh, so uh, first I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this uh, conference. It's been a nice time and uh, I hope this will be, this will continue this way. Um, so I'll present, um, uh, yeah, uh, gauge theories on Kappa Minkowski and some first uh, quantum properties of uh, our model. So the, the gauge, uh, the gauge model was made by uh, Jean-Christophe Wallet, who is my super PhD supervisor, and Philippe Mathieu. And we uh, together derived uh, so the, the first, uh, the tadpole, in fact, as I will show. So my talk will go as follows. Uh, so first, I'll review very briefly what Kappa Minkowski is. Then I'll talk uh, about the star product structure. Uh, and then present uh, the, the gauge theory we're using, and finally the, the, the tadpole computation. So first, Kappa Minkowski space. So as it has already been mentioned, uh, Kappa Minkowski is a good, maybe a good candidate for a, a quantum space uh, to, to have to feature some quantum gravity features at, in some regime. Uh, and these are the motivations to study uh, Kappa Minkowski. Uh, first, uh, it's low, low energy uh, limit is the Minkowski space. So uh, when you, you send Kappa to plus infinity. Um, uh, also, if you take uh, uh, a non-commutative field theory that is Kappa Poincaré invariant, then uh, it easily satisfies Poincaré invariance at low energy. 
Uh, also, Kappa Poincaré uh, realized uh, what we call a doubly special relativity that is that may be a testable framework. Um, and finally, what was already what was already mentioned also is that when you take two plus one dimension um, gravity with matter, then uh, you you have uh, some Kappa Poincaré uh, invariance arising. So, uh, how to construct Kappa Poincaré? First, you you start with the the usual Poincaré uh, algebra uh, that you know um, with uh, this. Uh, translation generators, rotations, and boosts. And then you will deform this algebra by with a small parameter kappa. So uh, so kappa Poincaré was introduced a long time ago by, by Lukowski and collaborators. Uh, and uh, we use here the what's, what's called the magic heroic basis. Uh, that is that we don't take P0 as a generator, but rather this, um, this E. This, uh, and so you see that some of uh, the algebraic relations are not deformed, but some are changed. This E appears here, and there are terms with kappa. So if you take kappa goes to um, plus infinity, you recover the, the, the Poincaré algebra. And also kappa uh, has uh, a, dim a mass dimension. OK, so now kappa Minkowski uh, is built as the symmetry, well, the space having the symmetries of kappa Poincaré. Um, and uh, if you, so it's a Hopf algebra. And if you compute the only the Lie algebra sector, then you have this relation. So we work with time like uh, kappa Minkowski. OK, so now the star, per, if you if you want to, to model uh, the, the quantum version of a manifold, then you can uh, model it uh, at the level of the at the functions on this manifold, and so you say that the functions on your manifold is now an algebra with a non-commutative product that we call the star product. And so, for our precise case of kappa Minkowski, we use this uh, precise star product. So this star product was uh, derived by Andrei Sutarsh. Uh, I should have mentioned uh, here. Sorry, uh, but we um, so. Uh, this is this is the one we're using. So it's it's basically a convolution product, with, but with this deformed term here. And we also have an involution on uh, this space, uh, which is all which also looks like a convolution with with this uh, exponential minus p zero that is kind of deforming the product. Okay. Uh, so this um, this star product has a, a property. Uh, that is, if you, if well, we have a trace on this on the, on this space, which is basically uh, the 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 Lebesgue measure, basically. And so, if you try to invert um, two elements inside the trace, you lost cyclicity because you have this e. E was the generator I was talking about before uh, that arise and makes that uh, f well integral trace of f star g is not is not trace of G star F anymore. And so this prevents from having a, a gauge invariant theory, a straightforward gauge invariant theory uh, in the sense that I'll show. So if you take an action and you write it at your field string star, your field string, okay. Um, it's, let's say it's transform, it's gauge transform as such with a star product arising and G is your gauge uh, parameter. So you, you take some kind of you deformed you one with your star product. Then this action, you gauge transform it, and you want to, you want to recover your action so that it's gauge invariant in fact. So you gauge transform, you have this G arising, the two in the middle cancel because of this U1, uh, U1 like stuff. And then you want to use the cyclicity of the trace to put this G in front and to have the two consoles, but you don't have cyclicity. So you can't recover your action. So this, uh, this naive action is uh, no more gauge invariant. So, so you can't build a gauge uh, invariant theory that way. Um, so this non-cyclicity trace uh, has been a, a problem for a long time. And uh, so, uh, Jean-Christophe and uh, Philippe Mathieu came up with a solution that uh, I'm going to present right now. Um, but first, uh, let's recall some uh, 
stuff about uh, derivation-based non-commutative geometry. So, um, as I said before, when you want to uh, go to non-commutative, then you lose the notion of points and of manifolds. You must work at the uh, level of functions that is now an algebra. And then your vector fields are uh, classically are the derivations on your functions. And so here, uh, for, for vector fields, you take the derivations of your algebra. So derivations are linear functions that satisfy the Leibniz rule as such. But because you have this non-cyclic non trace, uh, they choose to use either twisted, the, what we call twisted derivations. So I must here emphasize that to, this twist is not a twist of, 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 of algebra, okay? It's just that you add functions here in your Leibniz rule that are uh, homomorphism of your algebra A. Okay, so here, um, they introduce this uh, twist here that is E, so the same generator. Why E? Because E appears here in the non cyclic in the in this property. So, um, uh, and also there is a second reason why E, because if you work with these twisted derivations, then there are natural candidates for twisted derivation in uh, Kappa Minkowski. That is to say, if you look at the co-product of your generator P, then they satisfy this twisted Leibniz rule. So you already have them. And then you only need one for uh, like time derivation. And if you take this one, it works. Uh, of more, if you take the, the low energy limit, that is to say kappa goes to plus infinity, then these are the usual P, the, the space translation that you know. And this, um, and this goes to P zero. So the time translation that you know. So you recover the, the usual derivation you have. Uh, over more, E goes to one, so you also recover uh, uh, your untwisted Leibniz rule. Okay, so now, um, if you want to build a cage theory, you need um, um, a vector bundle and section of the vector bundle. And in non-commutative geometry, they are, uh, they are taken to as a module of uh, your algebra. So you want to define a connection, so you need a module. To build a U1 gauge theory on, uh, on a non-commutative space, what you can take is the module to be a copy of your algebra. And the action of the module is simply your star product. And so what happens if you do that is that you can write your connection that way, and it's fully determined by this A mu, okay? So the, the, the name is self-explicit, but it's the, the, like the non-commutative counterpart of the, of the A mu you know. Uh, and so then you can compute the, the, the curvature uh, of, the, of this uh, connection and it goes as such. Okay, nice. Then you can have gauge transformation. So first you gauge transform your connection and, and this makes the relation uh, uh, of the gauge transform of A, which is here. And then you can gauge, so uh, having this, you can gauge transform this F, which goes like that. Um, and also if you take your emission product, you can have a unitary uh, gauge and this go like this. But as I mentioned before, if you take this construction, then the, your, your action F, F dagger won't be gauge invariant. And so, so you, you, you can't take this. This is for usual derivation. So we, ta we take twisted derivation. And what happens is, is uh, if you take twisted derivation, then you need to twist also the connection to, 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 to make it compatible. And so if you do this, then you see that this E appears again. And so this expression is fixed by the way you took the twisted derivations, okay? Once you fix your twisted derivation, then all, um, all is fixed after, after this. And so you have also to twist your gauge transformation oops, um, as such, and uh, your gauge group is untouched. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not sure to have 
fully understand it. Here, the curvature is defined the usual way. Uh, but the curve. Yeah. Um, okay. You mean you mean this one or the previous one? So yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't see your point. Uh, yes, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, it's. Um, so it, it's defined as the curvature of the connection. So the, the bracket of the, the two connections minus the connection bracket. I don't know. So it's just the usual uh, definition. Yeah. OK. OK, so now we have the setup. And the good thing is here. Uh, you see the gauge transformation of the curvature as uh, another term which is this E stuff. So if we, if we come back to here, then uh, when you will gauge transform this F, you will have E appearing here and E appearing here. So that this E to the power D is, is confronted to this E here, okay? And so you can have this, uh, this action be gauge invariant, but as uh, as the non-cyclic trace property uh, has the dimension in it, then this uh, is only gauge invariant in dimension five, in space-time dimension five. Okay, so the fact that you require gauge invariance for this precise action makes you work in dimension five necessarily. Yes, uh, I can write it. It's so basically you 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 take uh, this computation, but in the end, um, so there is okay. So this, these two cancels because uh, of the, the gauge group, okay. But so this is for untwisted. Now you see that your, I should have put it, your um, curvature transform with this E, okay. So you have E to the power two appearing here and E to the power, uh, well, minus two because it's, uh, uh, no, two or four. Yes, two uh, appearing here, okay. So when you will go from here to here uh, using the non-cyclic trace property, you will have e to the power two plus d minus one of g star e to the power two of g dagger. And you want this to be one. Okay. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see, maybe I wrote a little bit <laughs> small, uh, but so the, 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 point, the point is here, here you, you have E appearing here and here. So here in the end, you have this E to the power D plus something or minus something. And so if you want this E to be to the power zero so that this can be one, D has to be fixed to a certain value. And this value is five, okay? And we, we try to change uh, some, some stuff in the previous construction to, to make it more general and try to avoid this five. It appears to be quite uh, a strict constraint. Okay. So this action is quite convenient because it's Kappa Poincaré invariant. It's gauge invariant because it's what built for. Uh, the, the gauge group is not the, U, the classical U1, it's the deformed U1 because you have star product and this dagger. And its commutative limit then co coincide with uh, standard abelian gauge theory, but again, in five dimension. So we tried to, uh, well, we computed the, the one loop that pole for this action. Thanks. Um, and 
So you have uh, a three vertex. That's why there is a, a tadpole. So we use the FADF, the usual FADF pop-up procedure and BRST gauge fixing to compute this. We we had uh, we used two gauge two gauge fixing. The first one is like the Lorentz one, but deformed. That is to say, you don't have d mu here, but our derivation, so the big X. And the other one is the temporal gauge, um, but with the parameter lambda that uh, that we could choose. And here are the the results. Well, it's not. It's not that uh, interesting to have the full uh, formulas, but the fact is it's non-zero first. So the the vacuum, well, the the, the model is not um, stable against quantum fluctuations. Uh, so make, let me make comments to conclude uh, on this one. So first, they have a good commutative limit. That is to say, when you take kappa goes to plus infinity, both Turns uh, goes to zero, so that's okay. Um, it, we made the assumption before to compute that that a bar is a as the commutative case. If you release that that assumption, that is to say, you have two fields, one a bar and one a, but it it make uh, this still not vanishing. If you add matter to the theory, it does not contribute. Um, uh, well, the, the fact that uh, the tadpole is non-vanishing has already appeared uh, for other quantum spaces. Uh, so the Moyal plane and R3 lambda, so it's not nothing new. Um, but here, what happens is that the, the gauge symmetry is broken. That is to say, we started with the gauge invariant action, and in the end, you see that the, the result we have depends on the gauge we're using. And that's why this uh, A0 equal lambda is uh, convenient, because it's uh, it depends on lambda. So something uh, in the procedure has broken uh, our gauge symmetry. Uh, last remark, it, uh, if we take uh, lambda goes to zero, that is to say the, 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 the usual temporal gauge, uh, then um, the this goes to zero and the goes decouples so that the tadpole is zero. But the fact that the tet pole is zero for this precise uh, gauge fixing is just a gauge artifact. That is to say, if you switch gauge, then you will have something non-zero, okay? Um, so this is it. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Uh, two questions over there. Uh, yes, this procedure, to circumvent the fact that the trace is non-cyclic. Yeah. Uh, does it work only for U1 or you can extend it to the UN case? Okay, example? so um, we, we did not do it for the UN case, but I think it will work the same because uh, UN is quite similar to U1 in this kind of constructions. It's just that you have matrix instead. So. I mean, I did not write it, but it may work the same, yes. So in principle, you can have an invariant action for a deformed UN gauge theory? I think so. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thanks for the nice uh, talk. I have a question on this um, twisted uh, Leibniz rule. Yeah, sure. Yes, so you mentioned that the Lee bracket you are using is the usual one, yeah. And my question is, um, do those uh, twisted vector fields, let's say, close some kind of twisted Lee algebra corresponding to the usual commutator, or okay, do you need so, to modify this? So yeah, uh, the the fact is um, here the the Lee algebra is uh, is commutative, so the the bracket of two two x is just zero. I don't know if that's your question, but here uh, in uh, in our Kappa Poincaré, the 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 p are uh, commute with each other, so that this this uh, Lie algebra of, of derivations is commutatively algebra. Uh, no, so I meant corresponding to the. Or maybe uh, I did not get no, your so question. My, my question is so okay. Take the commutator of um, of two such uh, twisted vector fields. Do they yeah. still satisfy this Leibniz rule? And you are saying, okay, this is just zero, so this is trivially satisfied. Yeah, that's okay. it. It trivially satisfies. Okay. 
Thanks. <laughs> So I have a question to the exact same thing what Paolo asked. Okay. Uh, is um, I mean it seems so when you de you define the derivative, uh, if if you can switch to that slide, uh, the, the covariant slide. derivative. Yes. So if I would instead of f, I would put a new, and then I would take nabla x mu a new minus nabla x new a mu is is what f mu new is basically. So this is so, the curve. so you mean you taking a mu here instead yes. of. Uh, no, I mean if if you for f you put a new, yes. right? Yes. And you subtract from that term the same thing with new and new, yes. Replaced, then this is f mu new, but you say no, this f mu new is not uh, gauge invariant or so. So you need to introduce this epsilon, right? Uh, so uh, f nu by itself is not gauge invariant, whatever in that theory. Okay, exactly. But the action, yes, we need this e to make it gauge this invariant. This e. So why don't you define the covariant derivative like a twisted covariant derivative with an e? Then you would get exactly that definition of f nu nu that you want. Um, okay. So the fact is. Yeah. So uh, you see, you would here. Exactly, you, yeah. You, if I would put here e. Uh, yeah, triangle, then I would get exactly that definition, basically. Okay, the, the fact is, um, uh, you have to uh, to make uh, this definition, um, well, the definition of your connection agree with your derivation. That is to say, the, the connection satisfy a Leibniz rule. Yeah, but the, 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 the derivation you also twisted then. Yeah, so the, conne the connection is twisted. The, you, can't, you can't see here because this formula is just the, the, the definition of A mu, but the connection is twisted actually. I did not put it here. And, and you need, if you take twisted derivation, you need the connection to be twisted in order the two to agree. Okay, and the, the twist you impose on the derivation um, tells us the twist that you will have in the connection and in the curvature. Okay, we have a question from, from Jurek, one from Paolo, and then uh, we go to coffee break. Well, basically, the question is, what is the differential calculus you're using here? So, so we are we are using uh, a, a differential calculus that is quite the, the same as usual, but it's twisted again. So the, the differential uh, is twisted, uh, I think. But the the, the 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 construction of the differential calculus is quite uh, the, the same as usual. I mean, uh, you... it depends. What do you mean by usual? Because uh, in, uh, this, usually we use the Shikash yes. calculus, which is five dimensional. And no, no. I, 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 my, my my point is that the fact that we end up in five dimensions is not really that uh, unexpected. Because at the end of the day, if you want to have a covariant calculus. You know okay. that it must be five dimensional. So one way or another, you're actually forced to, 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 to use it. Okay, so uh, let me, okay. So when I said usual is that uh, in derivation-based differential calculus, there is a way to, to construct uh, one forms and stuff. And this was uh, the way I called usual. So here you're talking about, um, um, so a kappa Poincaré invariant, uh, so kappa, yes. Uh, bicovariant differential calculus that is necessarily 5D, we don't use that. Okay. And, and so the, the 5D of this differential calculus is not linked with our 5D because uh, we could have a twisted differential calculus for any dimension, uh, but here the dimension is exposed by this non-cyclic non trace, okay? Yeah, well, I wouldn't agree with you that it has no relation with one another. I would actually expect something completely opposite. But yeah, uh, I mean, there is there may be one, but it's more deeper than that. If there is, I mean, question there, then here, and then we really stop. <laughs> it was, was the same question uh, you were. Ah, okay. okay. So I think last question. Uh, I have quite short question. You know, uh, the convolu convolution integral was used by Andrzej Schittas to define the star product. What is, well, is it the same which we are using? Okay. Yes. 
Yes, yes. That, that's what I said. I forgot to to put the reference, but yeah, it's the, the same yeah, software. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. Okay, so we can thank the speaker again. You have some announcement. Well, announcement, semi-announcement. Uh, we have a, a list 